Hello and welcome to Just the Bible Will Do podcast with Pastor Jonathan Smith. I want to take this moment and say thank you so very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to listen to our podcast today. We hope and pray that something we say will be a blessing and a help to you, and we hope that you are able to learn something from our podcast today. Uh, We will be starting in James chapter number 2 today. James chapter number 2 will be picking up in verse number 14. The last time we got together, uh, we was able to teach on the Christian and his brethren. Today I want to pick up on something else here out of James chapter number 2. I want to deal with the Christian and his beliefs. And James has a few things that he wants to say about the beliefs of a Christian. And it's important that you and I as Christians today, number one, know what we believe. Number two, know why we believe them. And number three, be able to explain why you believe what you believe. And because there's going to be a day and an hour that someone is going to come and question you about your beliefs. And it's your responsibility as a Christian to be able to explain why you believe what you believe. And, I, you know, there's so many different topics in our church age that we're in today that we can, we ask people, hey, why do you believe salvation by grace through faith? Um, why do you believe in eternal security why do you believe this and why do you believe that and a lot of people today cannot give you a bible answer and that's one thing that i hope and pray that you have learned here in our podcast is to be able to give someone a bible answer i don't care what my pastor said i don't care what my sunday school teacher says what does the bible say and why do we believe what we believe And so today, James, in James chapter number 2, we're going to pick up in verse number 14. But before we do today, let's go to the Lord in a moment of prayer. My dear, gracious Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be able to gather around your word today. Lord, we pray today, God, that something that is said or done will bring glory and honor to you. God, we thank you for the prayers that you have answered for us, and we thank you for the prayers that you're going to answer. And all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you are listening to the podcast for the first time, please feel free to send me an email at pastorsmith387 at gmail.com. If you are listening to this podcast on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment. Let me know that you're listening. It does encourage me uh, to know that you are listening. The last time that I looked, we're at 18 different states, and we're also in in British Columbia, Canada. And uh, if you are listening and you're not in the state of North Carolina, feel free to shoot me an email uh, to let me know that you're listening. Uh, I'd like to be able to put some names with the states that are being represented, and uh, it would does my heart good to hear from you all. But either way, God made a promise that his word wouldn't return void to him, and I can do that. And rest assured knowing that the word of God will stand. All right, James chapter number 2 today. James chapter number 2. We'll begin reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? James, when we deal with the Christian and his beliefs, we see James's approach, number one. And how the false claim, in the first part of verse 1, is questioned. James now turns the question of right and wrong in the matter of beliefs. He begins with the question of faith and works. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith, and have not works? And I think what James is asking here, and we know that later on down in this chapter, James makes a statement, faith without works is dead. But we know here in James 2.14 that the question is, can we divorce faith from works? And I believe the answer that is given here is no. When When a person has faith in God, their life will show evidence of that faith. 
Their service will show evidence of that faith. Their prayer life will show evidence of that faith. Their dedication will show evidence of their faith. Their testimony will show evidence of that faith. It's just like today if I brought home an apple tree and I told my wife, look, we've got an apple tree. This year we're going to have apples. Number one, that would be a mistake because we know that it takes a tree time to mature to be able to produce fruit. Number two, if I didn't go out and dig a hole big enough to plant that apple tree, what would happen? That apple tree would eventually die. Why? I can have just an apple tree, but if I don't put some actions in order to put that apple tree in a proper place so that it can grow to its fullest potential and so that it can produce the fruit that it needs to produce, then it will die. Just the same as you and I today as Christians, friend, God has saved us, God has washed us, God has redeemed us, and God has planted us, and you and I today, through faith in Him, we must show our um, evidence of faith. We know that the Bible says you can judge a tree by the fruit it bears. And today, friend, we've got some Christians today that are not... You, they are not. Um, let me let me see if I can word this correctly. I don't want to say sound wrong on this, but they are not living up to their fullest potential as Christians. And when I say that today is that they say that they have faith, they say that they believe in God, they say that they worship, but one thing about it today, friend, is there's no evidence. Of these things. Why? Because they are not putting works. We know works does not save a man. We know a man is saved by grace through faith. But a man that has accepted Jesus Christ through faith will have works to show that he is a Christian. Somewhere in his life it will be manifested that he or she is a Christian. Now we get to the last part. James here, not only is the false claim quoted, but James here in the last part of verse number 14, James here is the false claim is questioned. Some people see James as a champion of works against Paul, who stood for salvation by faith alone. We know Martin Luther, whose whole mighty ministry was based on Habakkuk chapter number 2 and verse number 4, where the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Though James here, um, <clears throat> though James here is quoted, a lot of people misunderstood James's emphasis on works. Preacher, what do you mean? James here is given us a James here is given us an insight of the Jews who placed all their emphasis on works on a rigid observance of the rites and rules of religion. And we see here that there was Christians who tried to follow in that footstep. Others went to the other extreme, insisting on no works at all. Such viewed a liberty, a view turned liberty into a license. James here is bringing these things back to a balance. Let me say this once and for all. As a Christian today... There is a fine line in living a separated life for God and being a Pharisee. There is a fine line today in living a life that is pleasing to God and being a legalist. It is important today that you and I must realize that we are not saved by works alone. And I want to say today, friend, we have came in a day and an age where we have got groups who were, who were just like uh, the groups here in the Bible that James is dealing with. We've got some that thinks that because their hair's a certain length and they use a certain Bible and they do this and they do that, that they're the right ones. And we've got others who have laid off and not done anything, who doesn't have any works at all. And they think that they're the right ones. And today, friend, we need to be like James and put it into perspective to us that you and I are not saved by works at all, but we're saved by grace through faith. And that you and I today must be 
that you and I today must have a balanced Christian life. James uses the concept of righteousness and justification in the sense of actual measurable perceivable goodness. Just as Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount. We see here James did not have in mind the imputed righteousness that Paul discussed in Romans 3-4. And it is doubtful whether his doctrinal concept ever entered his mind when he appealed to Genesis chapter number 15 and verse number 6. But James had a practical thought and application in mind, not a theological application in mind. James was not discussing the question of how Abraham was set right with God or how faith was reckoned with righteousness. Paul sees the aspect of those things. We're going through the book of Romans on Wednesday nights at church. And we know that Paul was will go back to the Old Testament. He will reference Abraham. He will reference all of these other people in the Old Testament. And Paul, you had no question where Paul stood when it come to faith. Paul sees that. James quoted the whole verse as Paul did, but James was concerned with it as proof that Abraham, when he put to the test, lived up to his faith. How do you get that, preacher? Can faith save him? We have all met people who say they believe, but whose lives contradict this claim. James had this same concern. I want to say today, if you say that you are a Christian, if you say that you've been saved by the grace of God, do not let your life contradict your action of salvation. Do not let your life, when you are say you're saved, do not let your life be be so worldly that someone has to question if you're saved or not. I think of a man by the name of Lot in the Bible. The Bible says he vexed his soul in Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot had a testimony that he was a worldly man. Lot had a testimony that he lived in Sodom and Gomorrah where the judgment of God was poured out. And today, friend, when we think about that, we think about the testimony that Lot had. You get over to the book of 1 Peter. The Bible says that Lot was a just man. In other words, Lot was a saved man. And Lot's salvation to a lot of people has been questioned. How could a saved man live in Sodom and Gomorrah? How could a saved man do all the things that Lot did? I will tell you how is because Lot was saved by grace through faith, but he let his works contradict his faith. I'm not giving you a license to sin today. I'm not saying that it's all right for you to go down and live in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not. But I want to say today, friend, be careful. Now we get down to verse number 15 through 18. And not only do we see the approach of a Christian in his beliefs, but we see the appraisal of the Christian in his beliefs. Preacher, what do you mean here? James here uh, brings us to verse number 15. It says, if a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food. James, number one, cites a case, the need is discerned. James had a mind, James had in mind a real need. We know that the church of Jerusalem was full of poor people. We know that at the day of Pentecost, the church had in all things in common, had not worked out in practice. It was in trouble right from the start. You can go over to Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 45. Cases of fraud had occurred. On one hand, in Acts chapter number 5, verses 1 through 11, instances of great generosity occurred. On the other hand, in Acts chapter number 4, 36 through 37, the first major major squabble in the church was related to this practice of communal living in Acts chapter number 6, 1 through 6. Because of human nature is what it is, the system broke down and the church was left with large numbers of poor people 
on its hands. The situation had been aggravated because of the persecution by Saul of by Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul. He had left many widows and orphans behind. The situation was so critical. By the time of the Jerusalem conference, the Jerusalem church urged Paul on the importance of remembering the poor. James was one of the people who advanced this proposal in Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 9 and 10. Not that Paul needed urging by James or anyone else to be concerned about the poor. I want to say today, friend, if you are a Christian today, and you say that you are a Christian today, it should bother us that there are people that are poor around us. And I'm not talking about poor just in money-wise, but I'm talking about poor it's spiritual wise. It should bother us that there are lost men and women, boys and girls, dying and going to hell around us. It should bother us today that there are other Christians out there that are starving to death because the church that they go to is not preaching the full counsel of the Word of God. We don't need more politics in the pulpit. We don't need more social issues in the pulpit. But what you and I need in the pulpit today is some men of God that will preach the Bible just like it is. If men of God would go back to preaching the word of God and preaching the Bible, thus saith the Lord, and not our opinions and not politically, but we preach the whole counsel of the word of God and we preach the gospel to every man, that would make this world a better place. We don't need a new president. We don't need a new Congress. We don't need a new Senate. What we need is a fresh breath from from God to send revival across this land and to feed the hungry souls of men who is searching for the things of God. Not only do we see the first need is discerned, but I want to say the need is dismissed. Verse number 16. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not the things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? To, to this day some believers pray for the world's starving millions, but all of their concern ceases with the amen at the end of their prayer. Let me say something today. If you're worried about the world starving millions, why don't you donate food to your local food pantry? Why don't you donate money to the local homeless shelter? Why don't you volunteer some time and help and feed those that are hungry? Our church has a small food pantry. We started in 2018, 2019, and over these last few years, we have fed over 5,000 people, and we've been able to do that on an average week at our or average month at our church. We have a blessing box, and that blessing box feeds... Uh, our, our blessing box gives out around 15 to 20 boxes of food, which is around 75 to 80 people that we feed on a monthly basis, just out of the blessing box alone. That does not count what we do every month when we give out boxes of food on the third Sunday of every month. Because someone had a vision for the hungry. And we didn't just want the prayer to end with amen, and that's as far as it went. When James talks about faith without works is dead, would be like this. If you had a car and you was broke down on the side of the road with a dead battery, and I've got to hurry up, my time's running out, uh, and, and you had a dead battery in your car, and I came by and I said, you know what, ma'am or sir, I have a set of jumper cables in my car, and that would help you jump your car off. You say, boy, it would. And so I go to my car, and I pull my car up, and I hand off the jumper cables, and I put the positive on your positive battery and I put the negative on your negative battery of the side of those jumper cables and I get in my car and I back up and drive off, then what good did those jumper cables do you? Not one bit of good. Why? Because my, the faith in those jumper cables that they will start your car is dead because they're not hooked up to another battery to give you the jump start that you need. Think about that today. Moving on. 
He said the need is dismissed. When we go through different acts of life, our, we, we think about people that are hungry, people that are cold, people that need certain things. We shouldn't just say, Lord, help them. But what we should say is, Lord, how can I help them? Lord, show me what I can do to help them. And God, help me put my faith in you to be able to put the works that you've given me to help them. Amen. Moving on, verse number 17. Not only do we see here the need was discerned, the need was dismissed, but verse number 17, when we look at the appraisal here, I see a conclusion to consider. What do you see? Verse number 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 18, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you, and I will show thee my faith. Notice this how, by my works. Today, friend, you do not have to get up and say, I'm, I have faith. I have a good prayer life. I have a good Bible reading life. A man who has a strong life of faith will not have to say anything because his works will show you what his faith is about. Have you ever heard the saying, actions speak louder than words? It is so true today when it comes to our life of faith. Not only do we, when we look at a conclusion to consider, we see James here, he gives us a great conclusion. Paul warns against dead works in Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 1 and Hebrews 9, 14. James warns against dead faith. He insists that we must have a belief that behaves. James deplores is the kind of faith that merely gives intellectual assent to various doctrines of the Bible. The kind of faith that claims to believe in the Lord Jesus who went about doing good, who has indefutables in the service of hurting people, but at the same time ignores the needs of those all around them. That according to James and the Holy Spirit who inspired James to write is dead faith. James here today said faith without works even so if it hath not even so faith if it hath not works is dead being alone. Not only does James give us a perfect conclusion but James gives us a pragmatical conclusion. Verse number 18. Yea, a man may say thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. When we think about that, James here is saying all some people, all some people do is say that they have faith with nothing tangible to back it up. But James says, I can show you why my faith is real. Today, if I came to you and said, hey, why don't you show me why and how your faith is real? Could you show me something tangible that you could show me and say, this is why my faith is real. This is one of the works of my faith. This is how God has blessed my faith. When you think about that, I read about a man one time by the name of George Furwer, and he was a student at Moody Bible Institute. And he had a vision one he had a vision to see men and women saved by the grace of God. He was able to get many of his fellow students involved in blitz in various target zones in Chicago with gospel tracts and intensive soul winning efforts. He left there and he began as a student setting his sights on Mexico where he mobilized a number of students to join him one Christmas in an effort to distribute thousands of tracts and New Testaments throughout Mexico. Later on, he went, he not only did Mexico on a regular basis, but one day he went to Spain. 
And when he went to Spain, they said, you might have got away with this in Chicago. You might have got away with this in Mexico. But when you go to Spain, someone will lock you up for spreading the gospel. So he did it to go to Spain as a missionary. He went to Spain as a student. He signed up for small classes or signed up for the least amount of classes that he had to do in order to remain a student in Spain. In the short time that he was there in Spain, he was able to he was able to come together and get uh, gospel tracts printed. And what he did in order to do that, he used the writings of early church fathers that was endorsed by Rome. He compiled the writing and those passages that were sound and published them as tracts. All the quotations from the church fathers that Rome revered. He also founded an edition of the Spanish New Testament that was free of the Romish annotations and that one that had the uh, imprimatur of Rome. He was in business. Those were the materials that he distributed wholesale. He, How could the Roman Catholic Church attack him? He was distributing the writers of its own fathers. Not only did he leave Spain, when he left Spain, he then went to Russia during a time that the Iron Curtain was solidly in place, when atheistic communism controlled the lives and destiny of millions. George and some friends made it past the Soviet customs and headed toward Moscow. Along the way, they left a trail of Bibles and gospel tracts. They were stopped, searched, and arrested and put in prison. They were interrogated, but George was unperturbed. He was in God's hands and in the will of God. He and his friends witnessed boldly to their jailers. They told them, quite frankly, that they had come to give the gospel to Russian people. He said, you say the the Bible is full of lies. If it's so full of lies, why are you afraid of it? In the end, they were given an armed escort out of the country, and all of their books, Bibles, and tracts were confiscated. George said, good, with a cheerful comment. You can be quite sure that those guards will read the Bibles and literatures, if only out of curiosity. Later on in George's life, he began to pray for a ship. And one day in his prayer life, he God asked him, what would you do if I gave you a ship? George had his answer already. George looked, said, Lord, I'll tell you what I would do. I, on my ship, I would have Bible teachers, counselors, soldiers, knocking on doors, giving out tracts. We would have onboard printing presses. We would have onboard books by the hundreds for sale, including textbooks and reference books that are so needed in third world countries as an incentive to get people on board. George continued to pray out and give his list before God. And at the end of his prayer, George said, God answered him, said, no, you wouldn't. And George said, yes, Lord, I would do all of those things. These are the things that I promised. The Lord said, no. He said, let me tell you why. George said, why, Lord? And the Lord said, you have no captain. You have no crew. You have no helpers. He said, what would happen if I gave you a ship right now? You would go bankrupt paying the port fees and paying the maintenance on the ship to keep it up. And George said, Lord, let me change my prayer. George began to pray and ask God for a captain. George began to pray and ask God for a crew. And as time went on, one by one, George began to receive his crew. George began to receive money for printing presses, for textbooks, and all of these things. And one day, George was at a huge Bible conference. And he ran into a man and told him, And told him his vision. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was 
When he told him his vision, the man looked up and smiled slowly. And he said, I'm him. I'm your captain. I have my license to run a ship. I've been praying for the will of God on what to do with my license. And God has given me the answer. When I, when we look about faith without works being dead today, I think about this. George showed his faith by his works. When we think about that later on down the road, George was given a boat. He called it Logos and sent out a new adventure in global evangelism. Then he asked God for another ship. He got another one and he called it Dulos. That was many years ago. The story of the operation of mobilization from then until now has been the story of one miracle from another. Some years ago, the mission stated that it had teams that had encountered some 250 million people face-to-face, not counting its radio and other outreaches, and that during this same period, it had reached 150 million Indian nationals with the gospel. No one would accuse George Viewer of having dead faith. Why? Because George let his faith be on display with his works. Lastly today, we not only see, not only do we see the approach, the appraisal, lastly today we see the application. James first cites the instance of faith displayed. Verse number 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. James is saying anyone can say that he or she believes. He said, so what you say you believe? He said, even the devils believe. The demons believe. They tremble. The word tremble here means to bristle and then shudder or shiver. They believe in God and are terrified. Theirs is no more mere intellectual assent to a theological proposition. They are very well aware of the doom that awaits them. He said it's got to be more than that. Not only is the instance of faith displayed, but James moves on to the case of faith disputed. Verse number 20, But wilt thou, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? The word here, vain, can be translated to empty. James has already said that faith without works is dead previously. It was more or less an exclamation here. However, it is more, it is an interrogation as though to say, God said it, did you get it? There are two main words used for will in the New Testament. The word thelo which means to wish or desire. This word embodies the emotional element emphasizing desire that leads to resulting action. The other word is bolomei. I hope I said that right, which conveys the idea of deliberate determination. This determination might be in accordance with the original wish or impulse, or it might be quite contrary to it. In any case, Philo is a stronger word because the natural impulse is frequently stronger than the reasoned resolved. James used the word Thilo. In effect, he says, faith without works is dead and useless. Has that registered? Are you willing to make a decision based on that fact? James was not asking his readers to make a decision based on intellectual facts. Or to make or to do good because it was coldly logical thing to do. What he wanted was for them to respond because they had natural, emotional, impulsive realization that faith without works is dead. In other words, the person who truly believes the gospel will instinctively reach out and tell others about it. Today, friend, I hope and pray that you have faith 
And I hope and pray that your faith has a testimony. I want to say this today. You say, preacher, how do I know that faith that faith without works is dead? Not one person that's mentioned in Hebrews chapter number 11 in the hall of faith, none of them had faith alone, but every one of them had works to back up their faith. And when we think about that today, you and I cannot serve God without faith and without works. The works come from God. God, you've gave me the faith to believe. God, you've gave me the faith to do this. God, you've gave me the faith to do that. Now, God, give me the energy and the ability to act, to put my works to action. Not to bring glory to me, but to bring glory to you. When you think about faith without works, on a personal note, as a Christian, I have had a burden for those who say that they believe the Bible, but they can't tell you anything about it. And one day in my prayer life, I began to realize that I could take my ability of being able to teach the Word of God and put it to a podcast form. Now, it would have been one thing to say, Lord, I have the faith that you can touch and help someone. But if I'd have sat on my hands and kept my knowledge to myself, that God has blessed me with, my faith in believing God could help someone else would be dead if I wasn't willing to put works with it. And today, friend, we God doesn't need you and I. Let me let me make that clear. When we talk about works today, James is saying if you have faith, your actions will prove it. That's what James means by this word works. And today, friend, I hope and pray that if you have faith and you have a strong faith relationship with God, that there's evidence and fruit to prove your faith. My dear Grace Father, Lord, thank you for this opportunity again to teach your word. God, we pray that something that was said today will help someone. God, if they're lost, Lord, we pray it'll help them find their way to you to be saved. Lord, if they're backslidden, Lord, we pray that it will help them find their way to give their heart and life back to you so that they can serve you, which is a reasonable service. God, if they're brokenhearted today, Lord, we pray that you've taken the word of God and you've healed their broken heart. God, maybe they've just grown cold and indifferent. We, God, we pray today that something that was said will relight a fire inside of their heart so that they can continue to serve you to their fullest potential. God, let our lives be a light shining out to this lost and dark world. Oh God, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so very much for listening to the podcast today. Feel free to drop me an email at pastorsmith387 at gmail.com. And uh, again, if you're listening on YouTube, feel free to leave me a comment. Let me know that you are listening. If you are... Um, if you are listening on one of our podcast channels, feel free to shoot me an email. Let me know how you found us. Let me know how, how, it, how, um, you've been helped by the podcast. And, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll dedicate, if you will send us an email and some comments in, I will dedicate a podcast to reading those testimonies, um, to each, to our, to each of our listeners and, uh, encourage them. And we are very grateful for what God has done through this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. Until we meet again, friends.